interspecific interactions and particular particularly we're going to look at interspecific competition and then just a little bit at predator prey relationships and then there are overall patterns in history if humans uh, with their placentas and other placental mammals had never made it to Australia there most likely there'd still be a lot of marsupials there and that's part of the history the patterns the pattern and the historical pattern that that piece of land broke off first from the huge Pangaea and what existed at that time is what ended up in on that piece of land. Now I do want to take just a little deviation and look at po possible interspecific interactions and I do ask about this on your uh, test or your quiz, your well your final. And mutualism, both the members of both species benefit and we call that a plus plus relationship. Commensalism is where the members of one species benefit and the members of the other species are neither benefited or harmed. Then exploitation, which would be predation, parasitism, those types of interactions, one species, the members of one species benefits, but the members of the other species, they are harmed. Okay? And then competition. And specifically for here, that would be interspecific competition where the members of both species are potentially harmed, although we're going to see that they might reach a stalemate, I guess, if you will. And we'll see how that happens. So there's mutualism. So the Nemo's dad is benefiting from his interaction with the sea anemone and the sea anemone is, inter is benefiting from its interaction with Nemo's dad. Same thing with uh, Moray eel, eel, eel excuse me, and the little fish that cleans its mouth. They both benefit. Exploitation, predation, parasitism, and I am going to add herbivory. I forgot what these are. They're somewhere in, I believe, Asia. Um, I believe they're in danger of extinction, too. There's been a mass death of them, but I forgot what they are. I tried to look it up, and I couldn't find it in a pinch. But uh, they're pretty interesting herbivores. Um, then parasites. That's the New Guinea fireworm. Thank goodness it is being eradicated, and it was a simple thing. This is uh, the Jimmy Carter Foundation supplied straws for people to drink out of because they are forced to drink dirty water, and in the dirty water, there's there the eggs of this worm. That's where they are, and so when people drink the water, they get infected, and then the worms hatch. The eggs hatch and the worms crawl around the body. They, the females make it to the feet and uh, they lay eggs and that makes a blister on the foot and it really, really hurts and burns. In fact, that's the New Guinea fire worm part. And then the person puts their foot into the water that causes the blister to burst and the eggs to be released into the water and the cycle would continue. But these straws have filters in them that stop the eggs from getting through the filter and being consumed by people. So this worm is almost eradicated. Uh, there's uh, predation. I, this is the uh, species that I studied for, well, I, yeah, this species I studied for my dissertation. So it's the ringneck snake and uh, it's eating a salamander. Okay, so that was mutualism. Commensalism, we've got a couple of shrimp that are saving energy by hitching a ride on a sea urchin. It's a, the particular type is the fire urchin. So these guys are benefiting. This one's being neither benefited or harmed.
interspecific competition, the lioness that is competing with the hyenas. Um, there's probably some kind of prey here that they're fighting over. Um, so it may involve actual fighting like this. And uh, then this is spotted knapweed. And instead of fighting for its land, it produces a chemical that kills other plants. So it can take over a whole field, resulting in a monoculture. So just spotted knapweed in that field. So this brings us to the concept of the niche or some people will say niche, but, and we're talking the ecological niche, not your niche is in you're working at a certain place and you're in college somewhere. We're talking the eco ecological niche. So each of the species that is present, that's probably incorrect there, each of the species that is present in a given community has a niche and that niche is its is the species role that it plays in that community or in this case it's its ecosystem in fact this is a nice slide someone had in a PowerPoint that says it's the functional position of an organism in its environment one of the questions I've asked you already is what are the three major components of the niche because the niche is multi-dimensional. But the three biggest are the place or habitat where the organism is found, or organ, yeah, that particular organism, when it is active, so time, and the resources that it, that it uses. Okay, so you can see the three primary components there. A while back, Goss performed an experiment in the lab with two species of paramecium. And what he did was he cultured each of them separately. So this one is, I've got to get close. I think this one is Aurelia. So when it was cultured alone, not an individual, but just a pure culture, only Paramecium aurelia. It went through an exponential growth phase and then started its leveling off with the little oscillations. A little more rocky start for Cod Autumn, but pretty much the same thing. Okay? So they're both thriving in their environments when they are not together. But they're two species of paramecium, so they have similar requirements. In fact, uh, we could say they had niche overlap because they're in the same place, they're active at the same time, and they're eating the same food. Well, they cannot coexist under those conditions, and that was shown here. So this species, and I think it was Aurelia, out-competed and drove Caudatum to extinction. So now let's look at the wording of the competitive exclusion principle. It tells us that two species cannot occupy the same niche. The superior competitor will drive the in inferior competitor to extinction. Now that is as it was written originally. What we found out since that time is that there is a second option to extinction of the inferior species and that is niche partitioning. Okay, so niche separation. That didn't happen with these paramecium. One, they were in a small container and really didn't have another place to go. But if they had been like these lizards, uh, of course they're also aquatic, not terrestrial, but look, look at these lizards. 
These are all similar lizards, um, but what they what has happened is there's been a separation of the place niche, the place component of the niche. Do you see that? Where there are they're living in different microhabitats. That is niche partitioning. Now it in addition to the place niche being partitioned so that multiple species can exist together, there's a possibility that the resource niche, so that they might also eat different, um, different foods. Some may be herbivores, some carnivores, some omnivores. Some specialize maybe on ants or something. And then there is also the possibility that some are day active and some are more evening active. In fact, I think that's what they're showing here, shady versus sunny and dry. But anyway, the point I'm trying to get across is that the community structure is impacted strongly by interspecific competition, as well as... Uh, abiotic factors, random patterns, etc. All those other things we looked at. But this, as far as a biotic factor, this is this is big. Not it's not for everything, and it needs to be tested. First thing is you look at a situation like this and you go, hey, maybe there's some niche partitioning going on, and then you would need to test it. Well, let's see. Oh, I'll let's just skip. Here, this is where it was tested. Now I'm going to come back to this slide and talk about it a little bit, but this was an actual experiment of niche partitioning. So competition occurs when there's some limited resource, okay? And it can be between members of the same species, which we're not as interested in at this time, or members of different species. If it's members of the same species, we call it intraspecific competition. If it is between members of different species, we say it is interspecific competition. So intra within the species, inter between. And for community ecology, we're really interested in interspecific competition competition, not intra-specific competition. That would be more under population ecology. And there are lots of patterns out there, visual patterns, that suggest that interspecific competition is an important factor in the structure of communities. And this is one of them. These warblers and their partitioning of the different parts of the tree. So Robert MacArthur noticed this and was studying this in Michigan. Unfortunately, he died of, I believe it was cancer, before he could spend his life researching this. He did spend his life, it was just shorter but um, showing that these particular warblers, which are all small birds and all similar in dietary habits and are all day active, are using different parts of the tree. So it was not that they sat down at a little warbler table and had a little warbler gentlemen's agreement that they would use the different parts of the tree, the superior competitor gets the best part. And in fact, a study would show that the superior competitor wouldn't use the inferior parts of the tree. And then the next superior competitor gets the next best part, and so on. It's a little harder to study this, to find the actual evidence for this, but it sure worked for Connell, Joseph Connell, with his barnacles. 
So he noticed this pattern. Now it's not as many species, but two species of barnacles. And what he saw was that there was this one species that was always in this area where it wouldn't be always wet when it, low tide was happening. And then this other species that tended to be wet with the splashing and all when it was low tide. So he thought, wow, this looks like interspecific competition, and this looks like this is the superior competitor, because it's pretty good for barnacles to be wet, and this is the inferior competitor. But he tested it. So his question was, did interspecific competition in the past result in this pattern that I'm seeing today? So what he did was he went out to different areas. He made his quadrants, and, and uh, in some of them he left everything alone. In some he scraped these barnacles off and left these. In others he scraped these barnacles off and left these. 